Hello and welcome to the second part of this Al Jazeera news special, Libya on the Line, The War Retold. I'm Nick Clark. Al Jazeera has obtained the phone wiretaps of two members of Muammar Gaddafi's inner circle. The phones belong to this man, the Prime Minister al-Baghdadi al-Mahmoudi, and the long-time Gaddafi loyalist Tayyip el-Safi. Our team went through more than 12,000 intercepted conversations. The recordings took place during Libya's revolution and war between February and June of last year. Gaddafi himself calls in regularly. Listen to him now, plotting how to circumvent an embargo and profit from Libyan oil. There they are, the uncensored words of Muammar Gaddafi. All of Gaddafi's inner circle can be heard on the recordings. Let's take you through some of the characters. First up, Saif al-Islam, uh, Gaddafi's son and heir apparent. He's the man who took charge of the reform plans that fell out of favor with the Libyan public. Listen to him now talking about how to deal with the opposition leader, Mustafa Abdel Jalil. <laughs> And in this next recording, Saif al Islam raises the idea of human shields with the Prime Minister. Another major player is Tayyab El Safi, one of the phone owners. He was close confidant of Muammar Gaddafi for at least 20 years. He's now in hiding in Egypt. And Gaddafi put him in charge of quashing the uprising in the east. And we hear him here speaking to the intelligence chief, Abdullah Sanusi, warning him about the handling of the uprising in Misrata. <laughs> Uh, then Gaddafi's Prime Minister al-Baghdadi al-Mahmoudi, he's now in custody in Tunisia where he fled after the regime collapsed. And the recordings document his often uh, desperate efforts to garner international support and that'll be the focus of much of this program. We'll also be hearing from Khalid Kaim, the Deputy Foreign Minister, as well as a number of more mysterious callers taking part in the diplomatic drama. All right, let's now examine the recordings of Baghdadi al-Mahmoudi, the Prime Minister, during the unfolding diplomatic disaster in the first months of 2011. He was a key member of Gaddafi's inner circle. Al-Baghdadi al-Mahmoudi stood by Gaddafi until the very end. <laughs> But one month into the revolution, and it was clear whose side the world was on. Nearly a decade of detente was forgotten. The United Nations voted on Resolution 1973, a document that opened the door for NATO to attack. <laughs> The Prime Minister led the regime's efforts to build a network of international allies. Even after the UN resolution was passed, there was still hope that the tide could be turned. Nigeria, Nigeria, 
قلت لك تو كنت اتكلم في الالمان ايه قلت لهم معناه درنا رسائل ودرنا كذا قالوا هذه كلها ما فيهاش تفاصيل كيف بتدير وكيف بتوقف وكيف اليات التوقيف المهم قال لي الامور راهي سيئه ضدكم ومفروض ديروا حاجه بسرعه واقترح علي قال لي انه تو وزير خارجيتهم يكلم وزير خارجيه المانيا ويتفاهموا معاه وبعدين يكلم وزير خارجيه بريطانيا وبعدين فرنسا انا شو قلت لهم؟ قلت لهم انتم قاعد انتم طالبين باشياء قولنا كيف الجراح قولوا كيف تضم الطرف الاخر يوقف شنو التفاصيل الفنيه اللي كيف كيف نحموا جيشنا كيف نحموا مواطنينا كيف نديروا كيف نحموا يعني نبغوا تساعدونا في التفاصيل هذه ما ظروفش كان النقاش اللي داير الان النقاش ضدنا رسمي انه هو الان كله على فرض حظر جوي وضمان ما يبوش ما يبوناش يخشوا بنغازي وبعدين تقديم الخطاب القائد انه اعطى تعليمات على الهواء مباشره بان الجيش يخش بنغازي يقول لهم مين بيكلمكم على اساس لا سيد الاسلام مش حيقدم أنا هنكلمهم أنا أنا. بس صراحة والله كويسين أنت تشجع فيهم هم كويسين. لا ما فيهم كويس ما فيهم وبعدين حتى رعايتهم للنقاش الحوار اللي بيدور بيننا ما عندناش معنى يكونوا كم مراقبين فيهم ما ماشي. إي لا معقول لا معقول. لا نقول لها لك ترى اللي دايرين إحنا بس مش معلنين عليه يعني البيانات اللي كانت من أملكة من نادي الدستور فيتصدوا ها هو الدستور. صح. النادي بحرية الصحافة هذه حرية الصحافة. نادوا بالمجتمع المدني هذا المجتمع المدني قلت له بدري للامين العام قلت له اخرته تعال جيب مراقبين احنا حتى المدن اللي تقولوا انتم محتلين احنا نحموا في المدنيين الروس ماشي اخبار في الموت فيه ما عندناش يا ودي الصيني كلمته مرتين ثلاثه ما عنده مش حركه بطيئه خوي Perhaps some of Baghdadi's most difficult moments as prime minister were during the siege of Misrata. The battle became a public relations disaster for a government claiming it was only fighting armed gangs and Al-Qaeda. Privately, the Prime Minister acknowledged that the government policy of arming civilians had backfired. It was Qaddafi's son, Khamis, who was leading military operations in Misrata. More than 10,000 government loyalists had been deployed. The audio clips revealed that the regime might have been led into believing that a pullout from Misrata could lead to its salvation. <laughs> الموضوع مرفوم في نصرات ارجوك وراس خوي خدر ما تستطيع قدوتي يفكوني من لان كل شيء انتهى بوقفوا اطلاق النار وانتهينا من من حلف نفس الشيء وكل اجراءاتنا خلينا نخدم لو مصرات غدوه اوكي اوكي هذه المهمه اهم نقطه اساسيه اللي والله ساعه شدني على التليفون والله ساعه شدني على التليفون يعني عن قال لي كل شيء اللي تديروا فيه صح وماشيين كويس وهاكم قابلت المبعوث العام ومشي مبسوط واليوم رد عليكم واحنا كل نتابعه في الواحد خذ وانا بعد بعث بعث وزير الخارجيه اللي هي افرق افرق بنسق معاه لكن الموضوع هذا انت مصر هاي 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 خميس خلاص تكلمت مع جماعته بدري بلغته وانا جماعه بيطروا بس الوار كونتينيوت NATO bombings over Tripoli intensified. Gaddafi's compound and several administrative buildings were hit. Members of the government started to move around the capital, from this building, to the Ministry of Planning, to the Ministry of Health. The airstrikes were having an impact and they were feeling unsafe meeting in government buildings. They also had to be more and more cautious about what they were discussing over the phone. So they had to look for alternatives and one of the safest options was to meet outside of Tripoli, away from military targets. Eventually, they ended up choosing a country house belonging to a foreign ministry official as their meeting place. During that time, the prime minister grew more and more anxious. <laughs> ايوه الو دكتور عفوا مؤخر بالليل تفضل اخذت معلومات اكثر هلا من 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 اصحابي هدول عاملين 
بطة مع القطريين مراهنين على أربع لست أسابيع مم. عساس بأربع ست أسابيع رح يدور مضاربات كتير قوية وأنهم قايلين للأمريكان أعطونا أربع لست أسابيع النظام بينتهي وكل شيء بيخلص موضوع الفلوس القطريين عم بحلوه عم بيقولوا اي مبلغ بينصرف من هون لست اسابيع نحن بنتكفل فيه مم. من نيتو نصيحتي ونصيحه اصحابي قد ما فيكم هالست اسابيع بدكم حاولوا تكونوا مش معروفين وين انتم موجودين كثير في يعني حمايه لكم اكثر من اللازم و... وتكونوا مخبيين اكثر من اللازم ما حدا يعرف التحركات وكذا لكل الاقطاب لانه رح يحاولوا يعملوا يعني تصيد ل Al Baghdadi's loyalty to Gaddafi cannot be put in question. Listen to these two phone calls. The first one from a man with a Gulf accent. The second one from a Libyan. Al Baghdadi, man on. Be the hal ya hoy. Al Baghdadi, boy. Yani, mungkin bismani. But. Ah, على أساس إنك تطلع. وتسلم بنفسك و... وترجع لأهلك وتعيش حياتك وأنا أضمن لك السلامة هشم على روحي وسخ يا ابن الكت أنا أبوك وأبو أصلك دكتور أنا واحد تداير معي جميل كبير هل قبل ونبي ننصحك ونعود لك كلام يمكن الجماعة اللي كلموا كامس مرتين ونقبل والله بنقولوا لك إن نهاية الرجل راه قريب وجودك معاهم هو ولد انت وعبد الله ترى خطر عليك. اه. واذا كانت تطلع تطري قامت. والله لان راهم مرفوضين. وراهم ابوك تطلع علينا جميل كبير معنا. شكرا لك Still, the Prime Minister knew it was a losing battle. By the end of May, he seemed to have lost all hope. كما المفروض مشيتوا في الكلام اللي قلت لكم انا في البدايه. هذه دوله معترفين بها تو شبه. Well, Mabruk Korshid is one of al-Baghdadi's lawyers, and I spoke to him one evening from Tunis. Uh, Mr. Korshid, first of all, if I could ask you, um, how is Mr. Baghdadi right now? First of all, I wished that Mr. Baghdad al-Mahmoudi had been present himself to uh, have this interview with you. Uh, due to his confinement and his inability to contact the outside world, uh, prevented him f from conveying his voice to the world. If Libya could absolutely guarantee his safety and his security, would he then be prepared to stand trial in Libya? How can Libya provide assurances of his safety in the face of the chaos, uh, still uh, uh, special prisons and confinement, violations of human rights on a daily basis? All this exists in Libya. How can Baghdad al-Mahmoudi get assurances that he will not be uh, uh, offended or his human rights be violated? That's uh, Mabruk Korshid there. Now, many of the people on the Libya recordings are well known. Others are more of a mystery. Earlier on, we heard one man who goes by the name of Mohammed Ajimi. He warned the prime minister that the NATO campaign was about to intensify. He was right. You know, we've been trying to find out more about him. Mohammed Ajimi is believed to be an oil broker and did business with the Gaddafi regime. He speaks with a Lebanese accent and he calls al-Baghdadi several times and appears to be acting as an intermediary with the Israeli government. Well, joining us now is Hoda Abdel Hamid, who's been through all these recordings with a fine tooth comb. And Hoda, what more do we know about this guy? Well, as you said, he is a bit of a mystery man. We tried to reach him. We were not able to. Um, he is an oil broker. He had a long-standing relation with the Libyan regime, and that obviously continued uh, during the uprising. He starts calling uh, Prime Minister al baghdadi al-Mahmoudi by end of April. And then there are several calls. One of the most interesting ones is just ahead of the visit of Prime Minister Netanyahu to uh, the U.S. And he clearly says in that conversation that there have been some sort of 
that the Prime Minister had been approached, but Prime Minister Netanyahu was not very comfortable or was a bit afraid that it would be publicized and it would ruin his visit uh, to the U.S. Listen to this. <laughs> But no mention of the Israelis there. How do you know that's who they're referring to? Well, he says the cousins, and the cousins is a way among Arabs to describe the Israelis. And he refers to that uh, several times in several conversations. And also when you compare the dates, uh, it's clear who he's talking about. Now, early June, there's another conversation. And again, he's talking about the cousins, this time about another delegation that is also arriving in Washington. It appears that Mohammed Ajami is in Washington at that point. And that delegation is of interest because it has good contacts on Capitol Hill. انا حبيت اقول لك شيء واحد باكد لك باكد لك باكد لك اللي قلت لك اياه رح نفسه يعني عندي كل الخطه العمل ورحت امبارح كنت عند اولاد عمنا كل شيء تكلمنا فيه انا واثق اللي وعدتك فيه رح نفسه رح تشوف في تغيرات كثيره كثير على الارض يعني بدي اياك ما تكون مشغول بالك على الموضوع ابدا باي ان شاء الله بس, بس ري ريحونا بس لحتى نقدر نا لا والله بكره عندك اكيد 100% بكره يكون عندك الله انت انت بتعرف ساتي ساتي فيك انا من اول يوم انا ماشي معك لليوم على الساعه لا والله العظيم بكره باي طريق بكره اسمه اشتغل وما فيش مشكله على الاطلاق شكرا دكتور على خير كل كله تمام رح تشوف ان شاء الله اخر الاسبوع رح تشوف نتائج كثير كويسه في تحركات اول فريق عمل وصل اليوم وثاني فريق عمل بيوصل بكره في حوالي رح يكون هون حوالي ثمان اشخاص 24 ساعه عم يشتغلوا على الموضوع من الجماعه اللي فعالين كثير بال كابيتال ان شاء الله عمنا يعني بالاسماء اللي انا تكلمت فيهم معك لما كنت انا وياك ماشي تمام تمام It's all very intriguing isn't it what's your reading of this Well we don't know much more than that we do know that they were trying uh, there was some sort of message that had to be carried we don't know what that message is um, the prime minister uh, seemed very interested in it, in it. Uh, he seemed to when he was not in the office he left message to his assistant to say tell him to call back so he was f uh, closely following that we also know from the phone conversations that Mohammed Ajami was owed money he asked for that money several times I don't know whether he received that money or not and we don't know whether uh, he accomplished his mission or not but we did ask the Israeli government and the Israeli government said it would not comment on this report well, more on the international involvement in just a second, but I just want to get on to the significant issue of oil and the part it played in the Libyan conflict. Some of the major battles on the ground, of course, focused on control of key oil facilities, but there were also suspicions that oil was the reason many Western countries were so keen on military intervention. Recordings suggest some kind of behind-the-scenes deal could have been made. Let's just listen to this clip of the Prime Minister al-Baghdadi al-Mahmoudi talking to Tayyip al-Safi. اي مكان محمود شمام وبلغوا القطريين وبلغوا الفرنسيين وصار اتفاقيه مع الفرنسيين 35% من النفط الليبي يكون عند فرنسا في حاله ان هم دعموهم استمروا وصلوا 
Well, you heard the name of Mahmoud Shamam in that clip there, and he was the head of uh, NTC's head of information at one point in time. And uh, please say he's in the studio right now. It's interesting listening to that, Mahmoud. The Prime Minister saying that at the behest of the NTC, you agree to supply 35% of Libyan oil to the French if they continue to support the uprising. Is that true? Uh, flatly false, and this is an old uh, joke. It happened a few months ago, and it was circulated then on the internet. Then uh, some French newspaper tried to use it uh, against Sarkozy. Uh, but uh, so you're suggesting that this is just a fabrication? That, that of these, these voices aren't real. It's not them at all. At all, at all, and nobody has this authority. And uh, thanks God, after six months now of this uh, allegation, everybody knows that uh, the oil. The, the Libyan oil are the ownership of Libyan people. But come on, you must have been trying to cut deals all over the place to try and never. Keep, keep the momentum going. You must have never, been, surely. Never, at least not from my part. Never. What do the recordings say about other countries' involvement? What about Turkey? It is the only Muslim-majority country that's a member of NATO. In this recording between the intelligence chief, Abdullah Sanusi and the prime minister, Baghdadi al Mahmoudi. Both men appear surprised and angry at Turkey's involvement. They also suggest that Turkey was directly carrying out airstrikes with financial assistance from Qatar. I was like, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to comment on my own. I'm going to talk to you about it. 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 I'm going to so that's Turkey. What about Qatar's role? Qatar was crucial to the whole enterprise, and this was a real surprise to the regime, and that becomes very apparent in the clips. Listen to this call between Taib al Safi and a Libyan who apparently had very close contacts with the Qatari government. <laughs> Well, Mama Shuman, you can well imagine uh, their surprise at Qatar going against them because the Emir had a personal relationship, didn't he, uh, with Gaddafi? They sat together at summits and so forth. So, why was Qatar so resolute, do you think? I think it's the friendship, the brotherhoods and some other interests too. Uh, Qatar is uh, playing a major role now for uh, solving conflicts in the world and uh, uh, active role in, in, uh, in foreign policy around the world. And w we see that uh, the Qatari role are now repeating with some uh, uh, d little bit differences in Syria and in other places. So this is uh, a major, uh, a major uh, role for uh, uh, the foreign policy right, of the Qatar. I'm just wondering, did you talk, talk very briefly there about the strategic interest? Just go expand a bit more on that. What is it that Qatar would have got out of this? I think that the motive, the major motive of Qatar is to helping uh, Libyan people. And, uh, and a lot of Libyans think, think that. If Qatar has interest in Libya, of course, every country has interest. And they have to protect their interest or they have to uh, uh, enjoy uh, whatever uh, they, they got from the results of the Libyan victory. A month later, Tayeb vehemently lashed out at the Qataris. Have a listen to this. Yeah. Now, at that stage, as I say, Qatar was sending weapons and training advisors and so forth, which is actually way above uh, the mandate of the resolution. Weapons were being used and so forth. The Qataris gave us uh, logistic support. Uh, they gave, uh, they, and, and they related those logistic supports to protect the civilians. So they were, they were um, implied uh, the Security Council re resolution by training people to defend themselves uh, training uh, our uh, uh, our uh, to guard uh, the revolution, uh, but never was involved on the uh, ground by sending troops or anything like this. All right, Mahmoud Shaman, we'll leave it there for the time being. But back to you just in a moment or two.
Okay, let's move on to another major topic of regime chatter in the recordings, and that's NATO's campaign in Libya. And just to remind you, NATO bombs started to fall on Libya on March the 19th, 2011. That was just two days after the UN Security Council adopted Resolution 1973, which of course imposed a no-fly zone over the country. It also authorised member states to take all necessary measures to protect civilians. It also tightened the arms embargo, adopted back in February. But the embargo stoked a debate over whether it was legal to supply arms to rebel forces. The issue was never sorted out, but the recordings make clear the supplies of arms were reaching the opposition and that NATO was complicit in this. Have a listen. <laughs> وعليها الصحفيين منهم فرنسويين ومنهم اربع صحفيين ولا هي خمسه الداخل نفسه. اها. وبعدين مروا من الحلف ومفوهم الحلف ما فيش عندهم ولا عندهم مواد انسانيه. الصحفيين يقولوا الداخل عليها شويه مواد غذائيه صح بس عنها اسلحه وكتابات وصواريخ عنها مقاتلين. وطلعت من الناتو. المصريين بكره اه ولا وظلوا حتى الاردنيين تو الجنان والترا على المنكب. إذا تراه وحنا يطبرق خش من أسلاح من ما وبعدين المتطوعين الأجانب وهذا البي بي سي والسنين جابوه جابوا لي تعرف جابوا العراقيين وفلسطينيين وأردنيين ومصريين أيوة حماس ميت حزب الله يوم يا سيدي أهلا أخوتك المصرية أنهم هم مسكوا سلاح في السلوم دائما الخطر ماشي بليبيا وخير هذا كويس ورا تدير رحنا وياهم خطة مشتركة تأمين حدودنا وتأمين حدودهم. هو رسمي استعد لك. ساعدته ويكلموا في موجات تقول احنا الناتو ما فيش خساره واحد دام مترتب. احنا عندنا الان حل. جاء وصلنا الخساره سبع غازي تسمح في دخول الامدادات الثانيه تسمع السلاح او راهم اضطروا نخش الميلان نستدعي القوه. في خيارات لان السلاح يخش كل يوم. احنا يكلموا فينا الناس الناس راهم نضرب نقطه تبعت وجه حرب. Well, we approached NATO for a response to those recordings. This is what they had to say. NATO commanders at sea enforced the UN-mandated arms embargo without bias to deny those who attack civilians the ability to import weapons into Libya. It was the Gaddafi regime, not the opposition forces, who systematically attacked civilians. NATO did not take sides in the conflict. He goes on to say... We made clear from the start that if anti-Gaddafi forces started to harm civilians, we would have to consider means that would prevent such an outcome. And you can read the full statement from NATO on our website, aljazeera.com. Now, earlier I spoke to Ronnie Brauman, the former president of Medicine Sans Frontieres. He was an early critic of the job that NATO was doing in Libya. Mr. Brauman, do you believe that Gaddafi could have offered a negotiable position early on that could have changed the mind of the international community? There is one thing that we can be sure of, and this thing is that uh, diplomacy, negotiations, political mediation was brushed aside just in the first uh, in instance. By the date that this uh, uh, recording was made, uh, Libyan uh, human rights activists, very closely linked to the TNC, were asserting that uh, 6,000 people had already been murdered by Gaddafi's forces. And this turned out to be entirely false, as Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International have shown. There were about two to, two to 300 people who had been killed. And this is, of course, much too much. But this had nothing to do with this 6,000 dead. So there was the propaganda was beating the drums. And in the meanwhile, Gaddafi seemed to, became, to, to become aware that he was entirely isolated on the international stage. And this is probably the main lesson that can be drawn from this. Uh, but earlier I spoke to the Italian former foreign minister, Franco Frattini, on NATO's role in Libya as Gaddafi was struggling for survival. And this is what he had to say. Well, uh, we tried. African Union tried. Uh, the Arab League tried. Even some of those that were considered some, I would say, uh, uh, facilitators, envoys, tried to contact the Libyan regime, but they refuse anyway any kind of serious negotiations, including with the African Union. 
This is why at the end of the day, even the Arab League decided to go ahead. Uh, Mr. Frattini, I'm going to play you a couple of clips now, uh, audio clips. And the first one is Saif al-Islam talking to Khalid al-Akimi, the deputy foreign minister, uh, saying that NATO were on the ground in Mali, uh, in Mali and Mauritania, uh, south of Libya. Have a listen to this. <laughs> You think that these NATO ground operations may have been taking place in Mauritania and Mali, and if that's the case, in what sense were they protecting civilians in Libya? It's curious, isn't it? I don't know whether there were uh, NATO operations, but I exclude these because this is to my knowledge. But uh, I said, uh, well, uh, NATO uh, uh, well, uh, was involved ex exclusively to protect by air, air operation, not by ground operation, but all with possible means tended to protect, for example, flows of people trying to escape from militias of regime. And this maybe could happen in the border areas between uh, Libya and Mauritania, between Libya and Mali, because these are desertic areas where uh, many, many civilians were killed by the militias of the regimes. OK, Mr. Frattini, I'm going to play you as Saif al-Islam and Khalid al-Hakimi again, uh, saying the Italian companies would be welcomed back into Libya if Italy would stop their involvement in the conflict. <laughs> when uh, Saif al-Islam Gaddafi says uh, contact them, contact the Italians and let them know that the companies are welcome back if the aggression is stopped, was that contact ever made, as far as you know? Uh, Italian companies knew at that time that the government was very well determined. I took a decision. The government of Italy backed me. The president of Italian Republic backed me. And so no, uh, I would say, suggestions, no advices could persuade me to stop protecting Libyans because of some uh, economic interest. But at the end of the day, as I repeat, also on the point of view of economic interest, we were right. Now, the conversations coming up were mostly intercepted on Tayyab El Safi's phone. Gaddafi put his uh, long-time loyalist in charge of putting down the rebellion in the East. Gaddafi's son, Saif al-Islam, he calls in regularly, as do at least four individuals who seem to be placed in and amongst the protesters themselves, but they're definitely in with the Gaddafi side. <laughs> At the time, Gaddafi's statements seemed like wild exaggerations. Blaming the budding Libyan revolution on Al-Qaeda fighters appeared to most of the world like a scare tactic by a leader desperate to gain support from the international community. Even here in Libya, many thought it was a ploy to scare off Western powers. Gaddafi might have exaggerated both in message and delivery, but there was real concern there. Listen to how members of the regime were describing among themselves 
the protesters when they first took to the streets here in Ben Ghazi. <laughs> That was us, but we're no different than other people. If you call us Islamists, okay, but we're sophisticated Islamists. Yes, we fought, but we didn't create an Islamic state. We helped lead the protests. We were providing water and juice and chanting the slogans. Ismail Salabi heads one of the most effective brigades that fought to defeat government forces. He spent time in Gaddafi's jails. He says there was only one difference between people like him and the rest of the protesters. If we went to the streets, we'd immediately call for Gaddafi's downfall. That's what we decided. Other people wanted to make their demands gradually and gauge reaction. For us, it was all or nothing. So we called for the fall of the regime on February the 15th. For sure there were people who'd been in Afghanistan. They were jailed, but afterwards had a normal life. Anyone who wants the support of the West while repressing his people uses Al-Qaeda as an excuse. As the protests turned violent and the violence led to war, the OJ recordings revealed that regime officials did believe they were fighting armed religious extremists. <laughs> I've never said this before, but people from other Arab countries came at the beginning to fight the jihad in Libya. But when they realized it was a people's revolution and that we only wanted weapons, they went back to their countries and left the matter to Libyans alone. By the end of the war, it was clear that Islamists had played a crucial role on the front line. Many of the fighters were from Derna. Gaddafi himself mentioned this several times. So we came here to figure out who these people are and what they want from the new Libya. This eastern city was at the heart of the first armed uprising against Gaddafi back in the 1990s. The response was brutal. People here say, Government forces really went house to house, just as Gaddafi threatened to do during last year's conflict. During Gaddafi's rule, I was considered a terrorist. Salem Darby was on the run for 10 years. He led a brigade of 600 men during the revolution. In times of peace, Salem is a business owner. He used to run this shop with his brother Mehdi, who was killed during the crackdown in the 1990s. It was different in the 1990s and 1980s. We tried to have small revolutions that were really Islamic in nature. This one was not. Abdel Hakim al Hassadi agrees. He fled to Afghanistan, he says, to escape repression at home. Saif al Islam cited him as proof that last year's uprising was led by Al Qaeda elements. He tried to use the fact that I was in Afghanistan, so I had to be from Al Qaeda. If the world had believed him, they would have supported Gaddafi against us. We were the first people to carry weapons. We got them quickly. Libyans didn't understand war. War needs planning and rules. It's not something you can just improvise. 
But even in the new Libya, many people view Derna with suspicion. The city is still reputed to be a hotbed of religious extremism. The media can come here and see. I am sitting with a woman, without a veil, and we don't have a problem, but we do have our opinion. We won't accept a constitution that is not based on Islamic law. No Islamist can raise his weapon against Sharia. But if there is one article in the new constitution that goes against Sharia, then I will fight it. Many of the former fighters complain about the label that remains stuck to them. If they are looking for Al-Qaeda, they should really look somewhere else. We just want to apply the rule of God, which calls for peace and understanding. When you keep on repeating Al-Qaeda over and over again, you will actually push people to cross that line. So what do they want now that their enemy is gone? Sharia doesn't mean fighting America and the West. We can cooperate with the West on many things, but we have our own way. We want a modern country and a civil society, not the type of Islamic law that scares people off. Sharia means equality and fairness. Women can leave the house, they can work and teach and drive. There is a middle way. Libya is slowly recovering from the ruin of war. New voices are determined to have a say in the yet-to-be-drafted constitution and the emerging political system. What comes from that process will determine whether Gaddafi's words were all stereotypes or real predictions. Mahmoud Shamam, uh, Gaddafi certainly seems to have exaggerated about the number of extremists in the ranks of the, of the rebels, but there's a certain amount of truth in it as well. Uh, of course, uh, the Libyan revolution uh, uh, gave opportunity to every faction, if I may say, uh, to participate uh, on, uh, uh, on saving the country. So how so, hard was it for you as information minister at that time to, uh, to hide the reality that there were so-called Islamists in the ranks of the rebels? We did not try to, to, uh, to, hard, uh, to, to hide it. What we, we said in that time exactly, that we are all Muslims, Libyans are, are there is no differentiation, no sec sectors, nothing. So this is Libyan revolution, and in the in matter of fact, of the first uh, days of the revolution, the people who were actually uh, on the uh, on the streets are ordinary young people uh, from from right, all Right, but there outsides. were others as well, weren't we? As we saw in Hodder's package there, there were fighters from Afghanistan and, and other places too. Some of them. She, she chose to, uh, she, if she wants to talk, to some people who were not in, uh, were in Afghanistan, there will there will be most of the Libyan people were but they, not in Afghanistan. But they were there. So if you, I, if you picked up few people right. and give them the okay. example, no. But they were there, and I think it's important as we look to the future of Libya now and the problems that that they face and, and the potential threat that many say that so-called Islamists will potentially railroad uh, yeah. Libya's future. The people who went in Afghanistan from every country. In matter of fact, the people who went to Afghanistan from your country. Great Britain is more than the, uh, who went from, uh, from Libya. The United States is the same case. So there is some people who went to Afghanistan, and not everybody who went to Afghanistan is a bad person. So you're saying it's not a, it's not people, a problem for, for the, Libya in the future? Uh, Libya will face a lot of problems. One of the problems will be any fanatic groups, any extremist uh, groups. But there is, Libyan people are determined to not allow to any uh, 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 militant groups, either from left or right, to, to govern or to affect the Libyan life. Okay. And this is what we see it in our election. The All election right. will tell the real story of Libya. Okay, we must move on. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's move on to some more clips, the calls you're about to hear. Gaddafi talks strategy with the three main characters, his son Saif al-Islam, his longtime henchman Taib al-Safi, and his prime minister al-Baghdadi. Well, once again, informants play an important role, calling in important information from within tribal circles. It might be a new Libya, but any decision made here is still tied to old allegiances. There is no escaping the power of the tribes. It's the tribes that brought down Gaddafi. The youth who fought are from the tribes. If we had not agreed and given our blessings, not one person would have gone to the front line. The meeting is about what degree of autonomy the East should have from the central government. 
Eastern tribes are putting their weight behind calls for a federal system in the new Libya. Tribal politics were hugely important for the former regime as well. The audio recordings we have prove exactly that. Gaddafi and his inner circle spent hours discussing who was with them, who was against them, and how they could play one against the other. أول مرة العواقير كل متذمرين طبعا من من القصة إنهم ما ما حصروا شيء في المجلس هذا نجحهم وزيد عمق الخلاف اللي بينهم هذا راد عواقير بعد كانت تحرك مرة عواقير كويسين وذا ما قصهم كويسين أنا عرفته خلي هاي خلبطرة من المعادلة مرة واحدة لما يبدأ معنا مثلا هذه العواقير وضم العبادات كقبائل فني يبدأ الوضع صلت خطيرة كبيرة من ناحية اجتماعية Al Abidat and Al Awagir are two major eastern tribes. The regime knew it needed the support of both to regain control of the east. There were three situations. Gaddafi first talked about us, and our resolve to fight him became stronger. Then he asked us to march towards Benghazi, and we refused. Finally, he called on us when the army was approaching Benghazi, and we decided to fight. The defection of General Abdel Fattah Yunus to the rebels only five days into the conflict was a huge blow to Gaddafi and had major tribal implications. Abdel Fattah had three roles, Minister of Interior, Head of the Special Forces and member of the Obadat tribe. His defection affected all of these things and it meant that the Obadat tribe had switched sides. The audio recordings also reveal why opposition forces had such a struggle when they tried to push towards the west. They lacked full tribal support in many areas along the coastal road. The areas they were talking about remained under Gaddafi control until NATO's airstrikes intensified late last summer. Very soon, the Gaddafi government felt the impact of sanctions and was running out of cash. But they never held back when it came to ensure the loyalty of the tribes, even at a time when there was no money to pay for the expenses of their own people. <laughs> Gaddafi was personally involved in organizing such meetings. He knew that winning tribal support was the only way for him to survive. When you strengthen your relations with the tribes, you weaken your enemies. It was a tactic. Politically and internationally, it was very important. It was the only solution. Gaddafi then asked for another major rally in the western town of Zlitan. Pulling this off was crucial for the regime's top members. Just listen to how much anxiety it caused them. However hard they tried, their efforts failed to produce the results the regime so desperately needed. Gaddafi's acute understanding of the tribal dynamics did not save him. He is gone, but the tribal structure remains and is as important as it was. Any ruler in the new Libya will have to keep a balance between all these tribes to ensure peace and stability.
And although it might have been NATO that dealt the final blow, it was tribal politics that ultimately defined the war. So, Mahmoud Shuman, why was it, do you think, that Gaddafi lost the support of the tribes? Uh, first of all, uh, the Libyan tribe, uh, through history, uh, was a, a, a power of positive, not a power of negative. Uh, they fought the Italians. We used the uh, tribe system to, to fight the Italians through th uh, 30 years of, of, of uh, struggling. And uh, when we come to this revolution, we could not find any other organization which will help to organize people and uh, develop uh, the struggle to the victory. Right, and but the there, tribes... there, were, there were many tribes who did support Gaddafi. So how, how did the NTC as an organization set about uh, trying to garner their support? Uh, most of the Libyan tribes support the revolutions, okay? And those so, that didn't? So, so, some of them has allied with his tribe and they supported Gaddafi. But the you don't look to the situation like this. Look at the situation that in, in, in the absence of any political and social structures, which include political organization, uh, civil society organization, there is a vacuum. And the only way to, to fill this vacuum by encouraging the tribes to play some political role. And this is temporary role, because when we have, after the... When so we so you're kind of bartering, if you like, a potential mm. political office? Not really, it's a, it's a bridge. It's a bridge to, to develop our system, to be a multi-party system, to be a political uh, organization, and, uh, and uh, etc. And when we reach to this point, uh, the, the, the role of the tribe as a social important element in our society will exist and will stay uh, maybe forever. But, but at least for now, the tribes are playing a very positive role. And the case I'm always uh, try to emphasize here, the case of uh, uh, Shaheed Abdel Fattah Yunus. When people, uh, some people pit and the Gaddafi regime, bet that uh, the tribe, uh, the tribe uh, will, uh, will try to, to act in, 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 in a way uh, show its anger and and uh, et cetera, et cetera. What happened that the statement issued by uh, by the Abidata tribe and the statement issued by all eastern part of Libya tribes was very positive and very uh, mature, and this has led to unified the front in very okay. critical time. Mahmoud Chaman, appreciate that. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's been a remarkable insight into the thinking, the strategies, and indeed the emotions of the Gaddafi regime as the war unfolded. And you can listen to everything we've aired and more on our website at aljazeera.com. We've posted an interactive timeline that shows you what was happening on the ground in Libya and what top government officials were saying about it in private. You'll find a selection of the more interesting wiretaps there too. Just click on the link to Libya on the line. From me, Nick Clark, it's goodbye. Yeah, I'm going to